Good. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the EO Cafe where the EO community meet. Um, I'm sorry. I've got a fly buzzing around me and it's, I haven't been able to get rid of it. So if I start gesticulating, you understand why. Um, so uh, very pleased to, uh, to be here again. Um, since the last EO Cafe, I've managed to, uh, to get away, have a short holiday. Um, we, uh, we went down to the south of France and had a pleasant time in the Dordogne. In fact, um, the timing was deliberately between EO Cafes, just so that you know. Um, we had some, some nice weather, uh, except on the last day when we were driving back. Um, and we debated before whether to go south or east from Brussels. And having seen all the images of the disastrous flooding in, uh, in Austria, in Italy, um, and uh, in Germany, um, we're, we were very relieved that we did decide to go south. Um, and it seems that each summer we now get uh, flooding as a reminder of, uh, of the important consequences of climate change, which is sort of at the heart of our subject today. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone, um, please keep your microphones off unless uh, I ask you to, to join and, uh, and talk. Um, you can keep your cameras on. It's always good to see people. And if you have a question, just pop it into the chat and then we can uh, we can take it when the time comes. You can also use the chat for passing on information and making observations. So uh, it's there for, for free for everyone to use. So um, indeed, the multiplication of uh, extreme weather events whether rain or temperature or uh, uh, the consequences such as droughts, heat waves, flooding or wildfires are giving us almost daily reminders of the hazards engendered by anthropogenic impacts on our climate. And so for some time, and of course, it's not just the indirect effects, there are uh, direct effects where um, ecosystems are being uh, uh, are being targeted, are being uh, exhausted and are, ch are changing. And so for some time, groups such as the two organizations we have with us today have been arguing for measures to reverse some of these effects. Um, and as a result, the EU has just introduced the new nature restoration law, which of course is the subject we're going to discuss today in the in the EO Cafe. Uh, it mandates environmental targets. Um, it in, envisages the use of Earth observation as a tool in uh, development and, and monitoring and implementation. And um, I'm very pleased to welcome two representatives from two of the key organizations who have been in, involved. Um, they've been at the forefront of raising awareness and uh, persuading policymakers to act and are still very active in this respect. So firstly, um, uh, Florencia Sanchez Acosta, who is a policy officer for biodiversity with the European Environmental Bureau, an organization I've not heard of before for this meeting. So uh, Florencia, at a moment, please tell us a little bit about the, the Bureau. And uh, Amanda Fronzi, who is uh, with the World Wildlife Fund in Italy and is the Nature Restoration Officer. So we hear about some of the work that they, they've been doing. So as is customary here, perhaps I can ask each of you just to say a few words about yourselves, um, your organizations, how you've got to where you are and uh, what your sort of key, um, key interests are in, in this respect. Um, Francia? Yes, hi, thank you um, for a nice introduction and uh, thank you everyone uh, for attending this you know, nice talk with us today. Um, I mean, uh, I so I am from the European Environmental Bureau. As uh, Geoff mentioned, uh, it might not be well known uh, beyond uh, the EU level, let's say, in the sense that we are an umbrella organization. So it means that uh, we are representing uh, all member uh, organizations. We have more, I mean, we have 185 in total uh, such member organizations. So these are environmental protection organizations at national level or regional level. 
and um, I mean, our work is to represent, uh, you know, the messages, um, the interests that they, um, yeah, that they manifest to us, uh, and do, we do that towards uh, the EU institutions, trying to, yeah, put under the spotlight uh, the needs for, um, I mean, in my specific case, for biodiversity issues, and to push for those uh, to be achieved. Um, me personally, I recently joined um, EB. Uh, I work in the biodiversity team uh, and uh, mostly on nature restoration, um, on the implementation of the law, uh, but also on other issues such as uh, yeah, um, large carnivores, uh, conservation, and so on. So it is uh, yeah quite varied in let's say also the field of environmental um, issues uh working on biodiversity projects uh from different angles but just a few words on myself okay thanks, thanks. And how how big is the eeb well, i think you've got a connect i think you've got a connection problem yeah yes. i see you you're you're there okay so how, how big is the eeb I'll, I'll I'll remove my camera if it helps. Okay. Um, it, but, is it better this way, maybe? Well, it comes and goes, so it's 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 hard to tell. Um, it would be great if you can leave the camera yeah. on. If it if it proves a problem later, then we'll we'll turn it off. Um, so uh, it's good to uh, see the see at least the guests, if not the whole all the audience. Amanda, please, a little sure. bit about your background and um, the, the World Wide Wild Fund in Italy. Hi, everybody. Um, as Florenza said, I'm very happy to see such a participation to this meeting. It's uh, such an interesting topic, and I'm really happy to see that uh, it's also really participated uh, from, uh, from your side as well. Um, I'm a nature restoration officer, and I graduated in international relations first, and then I did my thesis in restoration at the University of Copenhagen, and this is how I joined the WWF, because uh, uh, they were looking for someone that uh, was uh, um, was uh, studying this topic, and, uh, and so I, I managed to join the association. And uh, well, uh, WWF obviously works for conservation, is a well-known organization that has a different office uh, all around the globe. And, uh, but every office is actually works uh, separately from the others. We have uh, some joint uh, targets that we um, support only from the financial, um, financial side, but we mainly work for conservation in our own region, and uh, we work for uh, for Italian for um, Italian ecosystem and territories. Um, what is um, the general structure of WWF is quite complicated because we have uh, uh, different levels uh, um, and different office that works together. So we have the legal office that follows, for example, environmental crimes. We have the conservation office uh, that works for conservation of fields, but we also collaborate with the educational office. And uh, uh, we have uh, our own territories. We have a system of oases, and this is very specific only of uh, WWF Italy. We are actually area managers. And so we have uh, an office that is dedicated to this as well. Mm. And um, yeah, so this, uh, I mean, for complex that it is, actually, we are not many people. We are just 65 in the office. And uh, me, personally, I work uh, um, mainly on freshwater projects. And my office is made by three people. So, yeah, that was just to give you an idea of uh, how complicated it actually is to, to reach every objective and, yeah, to get uh, things done. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. We'll come back more on what you're doing uh, later. I'd also just like to mention that uh, Michelle Hermes is uh, is with us. Michelle is the policy officer at ERSC and um, has been following the introduction of the nature restoration law and uh, will join us later to come in to talk a little bit about what ERSC has been doing and the relevance for, uh, for, for, for members, including um, a, a working group that's been set up. So, um, to seek to mitigate the harmful impacts of climate change on, on ecosystems broadly, the EU has introduced this new legislation on nature restoration. 
It's the first biodiversity linked legislation since the Habitats Directive in 1992. So that's, um, you know, 30 years of um, uh, sort of stasis. Um, it looks to uh, deal with the problems of uh, decline of pollinators, soil erosion, water eutrophication, as well as many other um, problems, uh, and the issues which threaten livelihoods and food insecurity. Um, and we place a, a, they place a significant burden on national disaster relief budgets. So the impacts are placing a significant impacts on the, on the budgets. The um, nature restoration law was adopted in June this year and mandates the restoration of 30% of land and sea habitats in poor condition by 2030, 60% by 2040, and 90% by 2050. Um, the nature restoration law um, basically is asking member states to establish a plan for nature restoration to achieve those targets. And uh, for, of interest for us is that it, the text specifically mentions that the use of EO um, data, EO, uh, data coming from Earth observation sources, is relevant for the um, uh, for the development and the implementation. And so, given the comprehension of the law and this explicit reference to EO, um, it seems to be of direct interest to uh, Earth members and. Uh, we believe that there could be opportunities that arise from this this policy and hence the interest to understand it further so um maybe to to start off with to give us a bit of an overview of what the uh, the nrl does the background to its creation Francia, you could um uh, just tell us a little bit about the in more detail about what is uh, what it means Yes, thanks. No, I mean, I, I will just, you know, briefly compliment because you already touched a bit upon uh, that, uh, mentioning indeed the, the, you know, the what was the the previously existing um, uh, legal situation when it comes to environmental conservation at EU level. And then, I mean, we, we know that we have EU legislation which then translates also in national legislation. And until now, also regarding just the state of uh, policy development for conservation issues, um, was indeed very much um, the one uh, which which uh, was developed uh, with the habitats and the birds directive in ninety two, and um, in that sense uh, the approach to biodiversity conservation was that of uh, species protection and habitats protection. So uh, under the pre I mean what was already existing, so the birds and habitats directive was actually a state of obligation for member states to prohibit some some activities such as. Um, um, uh, uh, disturbances to habitats, uh, 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 destruction, uh, and so on. So the the member states had the obligation to protect, uh, but um, also to obligation to restore ecosystems, and that is the. You're okay at the moment, but uh, you did break for a short moment there. No, it looks as though you're frozen. Yes, it is a bit. Perhaps, yeah. Perhaps you. I mean, perhaps, <laughs> to, to turn off the camera. I can't, when you are speaking, I can hear you perfectly fine, and then when I start speaking, it starts glitching, so it's a bit annoying. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Or may, maybe turn the camera off now. See if that will give us a, a better. But please, please feel free to turn it okay. back on again. Um, yeah. Later. Yes, whenever it's it's a bit better. But okay. um. So that is that is a bit better. We. So hear you. well. Okay. So the, the yeah the the change that uh, the nature restoration law brings basically is that it um, it now requires for member states to uh, restore actively uh, the ecosystems because uh, the the state of um, environment uh, which was assessed on to um, 2020 uh, so there's a report from the EEA 
uh, based on number states reporting, but the I mean the assessment was simply that uh, 80% or more than 80% of uh, the EU's um, habitats and ecosystems are were in bad condition. So um, th there was definitely this need to yeah to to adopt the law uh, in order to address that issue and to start actively restoring ecosystems. So um, now member states um, have also under in international law. They I mean uh, here I'm re I'm making reference to the um, convention on um, biodiversity, so the uh, convention on Bio biological diversity at UN level. Uh, which also sets targets for restoration, and that was also adopted in 2022 by member states. So, in that sense, um, all of the, uh, the the all of the efforts now uh, at EU level and the national level will be put towards this restoration effort with this law. And um, I mean, that's what we hope for because that's what we need, uh, of course. In the sense that um, now we have the law, but then the challenge now will be the implementation. Um, and uh, we have seen that with the Habitat Directive that member states have not achieved um, to attain good status for this 80% of habitats. So this is the main challenge that we'll be facing the nature restoration law. And definitely, um, I mean, there is a, a big role that, uh, you know, um, will be played by how member states manage to create the information that is missing sometimes uh, to close the knowledge gap and to be sure that we do have the necessary information to define the restoration measures that are, ne are needed. Um, if, yeah, um, maybe I'll stop there and then we can address okay. other points. Um, no, but the, the restoration measures are defined uh, in, the, in, the, in the national plans, I, I presume. Yes, so uh, going a bit into the, the detail of how uh, implementation should look like, I'll turn off mm -hmm. uh, on and just tell me if it uh, works. And um, indeed, I mean, the implementation will uh, first need for member states to, um, to develop national restoration plans. Um, and these nat national restoration plans are, are basically, um, you know, kind of the roadmap to achieving um, nature restoration when it comes to the obligations, because these maps do reply to the different steps. So there is indeed the obligation to have 30% uh, of restoration of um, habitats and areas that are in bad condition. So it is basically restoring 30% of the damaged areas and damaged ecosystems by 2030. So that is the first milestone. And then it will be uh, having 60% of the damaged ecosystem restored by 2040 and then having all of them by 2050. Um, I mean, a very important nuance is that we're talking about uh, the, the, the damaged ecosystems. So it's it's not about the whole area. Uh, when it comes to the whole area uh, of the EU environment and EU ecosystems, uh, we're talking about uh, 20% um, for 20, uh, 2030. So, um, and, and so the net nature restoration, uh, the national restoration plans uh, will be defining in these different milestones, what will be the measures taken by the member states to achieve the restoration targets? Maybe just to, because I, I prepared uh, the two slides to make it a bit more uh, explicit on what we are talking about sure. when saying restoring uh, the ecosystems. Um, the I mean, the law has a list of uh, habitats and ecosystems, um, which must be addressed um, by, by the measures of the member states. So I will just, show that so that um, yeah we are able to see. Um, share. Yes, so here. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I mean, member states and the EU have, I mean, member states have this obligation to restore um, terrestrial, coastal, and freshwater ecosystems. And what is meant by that is the list of um, the six bullet points that you see on the on the left. So these are the, yeah, the ecosystem groups and groups of habitats uh, that, that are um, addressed through that obligation. And uh, on the right, you do see the, I mean, these targets I mentioned. So the 30% by 2030 and ultimately 90% um, by 2050. Um, 
just to note that um, until 2030, there is uh, the mention of uh, member states, um, you know, that they shall prioritize natural 2000 areas. And this is uh, um, linked to data availability in a sense, because uh, definitely the natural 2000 areas are where uh, there is the most knowledge on the state of, uh, of the environment, of uh, the status of um, of the ecosystems and the habitat. So in that sense, that is why the priority for the short term, so by 2030, is on a threat to 2000 areas uh, give, to give the time to close the knowledge gap uh, up to 2000, 2000, uh, 2040 and 2050, um, where this knowledge gap, sh gap should be closed. And it is explicitly mentioned in, in, uh, in the law. Um, and a second set of uh, obligations, so beyond these specific uh, ecosystems, is uh, linked to yeah, specific targets. So, I mean, I will not go in detail, but just to mention that there is uh, specific targets for pollinators, uh, for forest ecosystem, urban ecosystems, also agricultural ecosystems and marine, and as well as for river, river connectivity. So, for instance, river connectivity, it is about identifying barriers um, that prevents connectivity and um, then uh, uh, design measures uh, to uh, to remove those barriers and uh, and achieve uh, free flowing uh, rivers by 2030. So. Okay, so that certainly anticipated my my next question. So thank you thank you for that. Um, uh, presumably we can share those slides. With, yes, uh, I will. With, with it, it is basically a few points from the law ones. Oh, I think they were they were very useful. Um, I've got further things to come back on, but um, before that, let's um, let's bring Amanda into the into the discussion. Um, so, a number of ecosystems there, which are, are are defined. What work has the WWF been doing already, which will be impacted, or how do you see it being impacted by the um, by the introduction introduction of the, uh, the the NRL and I guess more broadly uh, the role of WWF in relation to in your case in Italy or other other countries the national uh, responsibilities as they the responsibility lies with the national level to uh, to respond so explain to us a little bit about how WWF play into this. Um, oh, thank yeah. you. Uh, but before this, uh, I'm curious to know how familiar uh, you might be with the concept of restoration itself and also uh, the concept of ecosystems and biodiversity, because it might help understanding our job and also the future job that maybe earth observation can, can do on this field. So, yeah, I don't know, do you, yeah. It, it can be useful. OK, yeah. So restoration basically is a uh, quite a simple concept to understand, uh, rather difficult to do. Uh, it means that you have an historical reference of uh, a specific presence of species that belong to a place. And because of any kind of disturbance, it might be pollution, it might be climate change, it might be urbanization. There are a lot of um, phenomena that might uh, degrade or uh, affect uh, anyhow the processes that happens naturally in an in a well defined area. Obviously, uh, this type of uh, limitation are just humans, so it's really important to remember that nature works organically, and we can't really draw lines across ecosystems, and mm. we can't really we shouldn't really think uh, sector wise. But anyway, so we, we did this classification. Everything starts with the Habitat uh, and Birds Directive. And there are um, um, a list of species and particular environments that are made of species as well. So we are always talking about species and the, the way they, they interact with one another. And uh, when it comes to restoration, then we might, uh, no, we, we are trying to uh, restore the favorable condition first uh, that can be uh, from morphological perspective, uh, geochemical, or um, or with the reintroduction. And so we try to set up the condition for this species to thrive again. And I don't know if I've been clear, but yeah, that's the concept. So 
um, when it comes to a specific target like forest ecosystem, that we need to know which exact species composition belongs to a place, and we need to try to insert it again in that specific area. And uh, uh, when it comes to, to WWF, as I was mentioning, uh, we work on different levels. So, so sometimes we push uh, from the political side uh, for the implementation of this very important uh, environmental legislation. And when it comes to conservation, we just uh, uh, fit in the big picture and we try to support the implementation of a specific projects. Obviously, sometimes they can be very big and we work uh, across different regions or they, they are also very small because when it comes uh, to um, restoration, uh, the most affected areas usually are not uh, the, the already protected ones, but we work on urban areas. And so we try to bring natural areas within uh, our cities and uh, or also a very important role of restoration is to link natural areas between one another, because this is a specific issue. So when uh, uh, natural areas get uh, separated, uh, this uh, stops a lot of uh, biological and ecological process from happening. And so it's a real issue that cause the decline of many different species that doesn't have the mobility to grow, to, um, uh, to overcome this challenge. And yeah, so from, uh, from our side, um, this is what we do. Basically, we try to either to work on the ground and to favor, to facilitate the, re, um, the constitution of these new natural areas, or we work at the policy level to push for actual implementation. So, uh, um, question for either or, or both of you, because Florencia, in your slide, um, and Amanda, you've talked about sort of the um, ecosystems which are not in good condition. So what, what does that mean and how is it um, measured, evaluated, defined? I, Amanda, you're nodding, so. <laughs> oh, well, um, this, is, uh, this is usually done expert-based. So, um, for example, if, I, if there is a, a pollution, a, a contaminant that um, doesn't allow um, if uh, um, doesn't allow nature to thrive, uh, it's really easy to see it. But when it comes to, for example, for example, alien species, uh, alien species are not uh, easy to understand, uh, easy to spot mm. uh, unless uh, you're an expert about it. Especially when it comes to vegetation, this is such a big issue because uh, alien species. Uh, uh, compete for the same resources and tend to substitute to native uh, to native species and uh, at the end they they manage to um, to de to make them decline and uh, um, and so yeah basically this kind of assessment is being made for years and years from uh, experts and they they work on different levels so they work for the reporting 17 that is the that is mandatory for every country in Europe to, fu to, um, to fulfill and to declare the status of habitats uh, right. that are listed in, in the um, habitat directive. And this is just one way. Then there is the IUCN list that works for species specifically. And obviously also, for example, in Italy, we have environmental agency that work at regional level. Yeah. So they also work for their own specific uh, um, areas and um, and targets, so it's uh, really complicated, and this uh, is one of the issues that we have. That actually, that we have many data sets, not always communicating with one another. So when it comes to priority, priori prioritization of um, of actions and and of uh, objectives, uh, sometimes it might it might be hard to assess where whether to start. So that's exa exactly what I was. Next, next going was um, to uh, to ask about priorities. Um, are the are the priorities defined? What are the ways to evaluate priorities? Is it related to the cost of doing something or the impact of doing something? How will this be uh, uh, controlled and uh, managed? Florencia, maybe. 
um, in, in which specific framework? Because um, the monitoring and uh, the favorable conservation status, which was just explained by Amanda, is under the Habitats Directive. So yeah. it is, a, it, I mean, that monitoring system and uh, kind of the reporting under that has been, you know, like kind of in place um, for a long time. Uh, but then, yeah, the, then, the, yeah, just to clarify, so is it that that we're addressing or? No, I, I was, I mean, um, I understand that the Habitats Directive is is a sort of a, um, a framework, a baseline, um, and that uh, now the uh, the nature restoration um, plans will mm -hmm. have to define how they're going to get back to, um, you know, 30% um, yeah. Um, correct so, by 2030 and so on. So mm -hmm. it's a question of, you know, member states can define their priorities, but maybe they define all those which cost the least and which don't have uh, don't yeah. have a big impact. So yeah. how is it evaluated in terms of uh, uh, mm -hmm. impact? And is our priorities set uh, yeah. or to be set? Yeah, okay. Thanks, and I, yeah. Um, no, so indeed, when it comes to, to what will be the, the, the NRP order of implementation, in a sense, mm. uh, it will be, I mean, yeah, based on available, uh, you know, what, what are the measures already being put in place? Um, what is the available knowledge? So, uh, because member states will have, I mean, the exercise that will be now ongoing to, to, to develop the na national restoration plans is uh, in terms of scope, it is way broader than what we had under the Habitats Directive. Yeah. Because for the Habitats Directive, um, I mean, when we were talking about uh, favorable conservation status assessments and so on, that concerned only um, what we call the natural 2000 areas and protected areas, which is a very small uh, portion. I think I have the, yeah, I mean, I have the number of uh, square kilometers, but um, it, it's just a small portion on, on actually what is, uh, you know, like kind of, I mean, I am, yeah, environment uh, in, in the EU. And um, the in that sense, let's say the geographical scope of what we are aiming with the nature restoration law is uh, all of the, you know, all of the available area in the EU. Um, so it will be broader. And in that sense, that is why the first uh, priority actions will be taken in protected areas because uh, that is where we do have the knowledge available. Um, but then uh, obviously for each of the measures will come into play cost and effectiveness and uh, also pace of implementation. Um, I mean, the obligation for member states is, is to put measures in place. Um, it is not result based. So uh, the law doesn't say that we will have restored nature in 2050. It will say it says that we will have measures to restore all of the uh, yeah all of the um, ecosystems which are in bad state by 2050. So in that sense, um, yeah, we will have you know the development of these measures. Uh, these measures starting uh, to be put in place, um, and indeed the order of priority will be defined by what is available in terms of already measures uh, on the ground. What is the available knowledge? And uh, there again, the knowledge gap I mentioned, we have, uh, I mean, we do have a knowledge gap uh, for uh, many ecosystems where part of them, we don't know what their status is. Um, and that ha that will uh, that will have to be, um, yeah, researched on and identified and, um, yeah. Okay. And um, so the, the role of earth observation um that's obviously something which which interests us maybe we come back to the the, the plans uh later um what's your perception of of the role that earth observation can play in all this so yeah I, actually it is it is uh, very closely related with the with the plans because so i mean um the plans have to identify the areas where the restoration should be um should, should be done so in that sense, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, to me, at least when I read the, the law, it is very clear that, I mean, to identify areas and to and identify, um, you know, like kind of a, uh, also the, the evolution in these areas, because uh, the plans will also have to um, to already define what will be the monitoring uh, systems in place uh, to, to ensure the restoration and so on. I mean, all of that mapping pro um, mapping exercise will definitely, I think, uh, need 
Earth observation uh, data. When do the plants have to be produced by? Mm -hmm. So the, um, I mean, the member states have two years to develop them. So um, in a sense, it's it's it means two years to have, I mean, the, their first plan uh, with, um, as I said, uh, kind of already defined measures up until 2030. Um, and then kind of priorities uh, for 2050. So uh, it will be just yeah a big guiding uh, directions uh, for the long term and um, set measures for 2030. And um, I mean yeah so they, they have these two years to develop them and then um, I'm looking again my notes so then they will have to have a revision. Um, I think it will be every yeah, every 10 years. So the first revision is uh, for 2032 and then 2042. So in that sense, um, yeah, the, I mean, the change in knowledge in between this, um, yeah, uh, these periods uh, will be taken into into consideration when revising the plans. So your companies should be uh, actively thinking about the different information that they can provide to support member states with a good dialogue with the member states to uh, to understand that further um uh, maybe let me, let me ask michelle at this point to um sort of give a, a comment from what ersk has been doing and particularly what ersk is is planning to do yeah so just i think uh i can comment a little bit more on on the the role of earth observation that's called for in the law specifically um and then also mention what our ERSC activities are in this context. So um, there are a lot of mentions specifically of the Copernicus program, um, but also of Galileo and Egnos in the law saying that um, specifically in the context of the national restoration plans, the member states should make the best possible use of the EU space program, but that they should also obtain all possible supplementary data that they might need um, specifically for the monitoring systems. Um, maximizing EO remote sensing and leveraging AI data analysis and processing. So it's pretty open, I think, still. I mean, we know about the many potential opportunities for, for Earth observation in this domain, but I think in the context of, of the implementation, the possibilities are sort of still endless, which is why in ERSC, um, we've launched now um, a working group on the nature restoration law, where we're going to try to understand, you know, what the private sector um, can contribute in terms of biodiversity monitoring. So there's already been some work done at the EU level on understanding um, what publicly available data sources uh, can do um, for biodiversity monitoring, but we want to um, better understand how members of ERSC uh, specifically can can contribute to this implementation. So if you're an ERSC member, uh, I know many of the ERSC members who are here uh, have already signed up to join this working group, but um, if you are an ERSC member and you're interested, um, you can feel free to contact me and we'll kick off our activities uh, in the coming weeks for this working group. And thank you to both Amanda and Florencia for all of the valuable input so far. We're definitely gonna bring them into the working group. Um, and I look forward to continuing the discussion on this. Okay, thanks. Amanda, did you want to add anything around the uh, the use of EO? Uh, well, um, I think that it will be really interesting to develop indicators together. I mean, um, yeah, uh, as I was mentioning before, there are different level of uh, uh, restoration that can be done uh, or pursue. And uh, mm, one field of research that I think will be really valuable is to try to train uh, Earth observation model based on um, ground, ground data, yeah, ground data, and to discover together how, um, for example, uh, we can uh, monitor or assess uh, the health condition of an ecosystem mm. from Earth observation, because uh, this is a field that is still need to be explored, and we might not be aware of uh, indicators that can be uh, valued or trained from, I mean, I'm talking together because I, I think that the perspective of the con conservation, conservation field 
and yeah so i thought about that and i also think uh, it's really uh, valuable and maybe underrated that the role for communication i believe that we made such a uh, such a, a big step when we we start uh, we started seeing glacier redu uh, reducing in size or uh, uh, wetlands disappearing due to climate change and now we can see the images and this uh, is really really uh, it really makes the difference to make people aware to raise awareness about these uh, the important issue that we're living so yeah 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 and a quick question of scale as well um regarding the governance does um does the eea have a have a role here in terms of uh, monitoring um one, one of the things i'm getting at behind that question is uh, taken, been quite interested recently through the work we've done in in SEBS about sort of networks of um, experts who can exchange the knowledge of best practice and can develop best practice together. So I was wondering, then thinking on whether the EEA has a has a role here and whether they their sort of networks will um, will, will facilitate that process. Yeah, definitely. Because I'm sorry, Florencia. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Amanda. Please, I, I, I'll jump in afterwards. Don't worry. No, I just, uh, I just thought it was, uh, um, it was really valuable. So it was, uh, it was just uh, highlighting that. Okay. No, yeah, and I mean, I, I was going to reply along the same lines. Uh, I don't, I don't know of any such plans from EEA. I hope, uh, because indeed, I mean. Uh, sharing of of uh, good practices is kind of yeah like the key word when we talk about this type of uh, yeah of new yeah I don't know obligations which come with obviously uh, needs uh, for uh, yeah the, the countries the also I mean at regional level to be aware of what 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 has already been done similar situations and so on so definitely for the moment what we know is only that EA will be involved when it comes to the assessment and the reporting uh, exercises. So th there will be a contact point for members for member states. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the setting up of, of a specific, um, yeah, let's say, I don't know, like how they call it, um, uh, community of practice or this type of thing, we, yeah. we're not uh, yet aware of anything. Yeah. Yeah, um, particularly a lot of the implementation of these um, uh, falls to a local and regional level. And uh, so even within countries, there's not often a good community of practice or a network of experts and a sharing of, uh, of knowledge, um, even within countries. And we're talking with experts, you know, they, they are very frustrated that they can't get that sort of um, network in place. So I think um, anything that can be done there will be, will be very helpful and maybe uh, um, your organisations will be able to, um, to, to support and play on that. Um, one question in the chat, let me come, come to that now. Uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Mondon. Are you there, Emmanuel? Sure. Hi, Hi Jeff, I'm there, I'm at uh, yeah. the Metro, so All right. you please read for me the... Yeah, sure, so... The question uh, it to be easier for everybody, thanks. Yeah, Emmanuel... Uh, us regarding the um, global biodiversity score, which has been um, triggered. Sorry, I'm, it's the, the fly that's bothering me. Um, triggered uh, in, in France. Um, are you aware of this and what links are there, if any, to, uh, to the uh, NRL? Or with your work more generally? Uh, I'm, I'm personally not aware of the specifics. I mean, I and kind of guess, um, but not, I mean, yeah, I don't know, yeah, Emmanuel being in the metro, I don't know if he can give a few words of explanation what, what it is exactly, or or Amanda, if you've come across similar instruments. Sure. Or anyone else on the call, if uh, if anyone mm -hmm. else in the cafe, if they know about it. It sounds like it ought to be something uh, that links to this question of good condition. Or at least to-, uh, to Jeff, Jeff do you hear me? Emmanuel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let, let's try. Um, yeah, so uh, lots of people are addressing biodiversity. 
but you don't have any uh, single uh, common reference. So mm. what uh, Caisse de Depot and specifically uh, its uh, subsidiary dedicated to, uh, to biodiversity made is such a biodiversity framework in order to assess the biodiversity uh, and then anyone could use the same framework. Um, I will uh, I will share in the chat um, the link to, to this uh, global biodiversity score. Yeah, thanks. No, that will be that will be helpful. And um, there's a comment in there, and I'll um, I'll repeat it in case people have uh, have not seen it. But there will be a um, conference dedicated to EO and biodiversity organised in Prascati, organised by ESA in Prascati in February next year. And there's a, a call for abstracts, which is open until October the 20th. Uh, there's a link there for anybody who wants to um, to, to find out more. Mm -hmm. um, um, so if, if I may maybe just jump in, uh, in a bit mm -hmm. like the discussion open uh, by the Global Biodiversity Score of Caisse de Depot. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, this tool uh, was developed, I mean, as Emmanuel mentioned, th there is no global indicator or used uh, globally. Of when it comes to biodiversity, also because I mean, and Amanda pointed to it earlier. Each ecosystem and each ecosystem component has their own specificities, so requires their own indicators. And uh, we do have a challenge. Uh, I mean, in the EU, if we want to work together, it is definitely that. Um, I mean, each country and each region sometimes uses different indicators to assess maybe similar things. Um, so I, I guess uh, this, this uh, you know, and, and that is a bit what uh, the, the uh, Convention for uh, Biological Diversity, so the, the COP uh, that will be happening in October is also trying to address, uh, trying to define, let's say, global uh, and, and uh, commonly used uh, indicators to assess biodiversity state and so yeah. on. So I guess this um, initiative from the Caisse de Depot is kind of like, yeah, like their, their inputs to that in a sense and uh, kind of a private initiative to try to um, give some sense of, of yeah, uh, biodiversity assessments. Mm. Um, but uh, but yeah, definitely it, it is, I mean, one currently one of the challenges uh, and also for the implementation of nature restoration law uh, that there will be uh, the needs to have such commonly shared and used indicators. Okay, um, Amanda? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I just gave it a, a quick look uh, and uh, it looks to me that is related to the, um, to the topic of biodiversity credits somehow and also how to uh, involve finance in uh, uh, natural restoration. Is, is that correct? Well, this is a question for uh, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to um, I'm going to move on, and we can come back uh, later if Emmanuel Emmanuel's in the metro, so uh, it's probably a bit a bit difficult. Um, Herman Herman Vesterbaker. All right, I think I'm uh, audible, and now yeah, we hear you. You should be able to see me as well anytime soon. Not that that's important. Yeah, I just put in some comments about about this, but I my question was more about the study itself, uh, uh, because uh, ERSC uh, uh, is still very much uh, has space based remote sensing, and and um, sort of this this uh, study you're going to do, this group you're going to put together, obviously very valuable. But uh, I have always been and still am the uh, the advocate for uh, combining all types of geospatial and hydrospatial uh, uh, data. I'm very much in the hydrospatial uh, uh, arena nowadays. And and it's really where it all comes together. I've seen this, for instance, with uh, uh, monitoring um, of, uh, of seagrass. Uh, and it's really where uh, space-based uh, observations play a very important role. But by themselves, they only come to a certain point. However, combined with an aerial survey, uh, with a bathymetric survey, and, and with actually uh, going down to the seafloor with uh, uh, measuring equipment, and, and, and then 
uh, obviously the machine learning, the the the, the AI magic that uh, can can derive extra value. This is where you get more uh, out of the 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 sum of these uh, uh, the, the combination of these technologies. So is it? Are you going to try to sort of take that into account as well? Because as I wrote, on one hand, that makes it uh, sort of boiling the ocean, so to say, that there, there is so much out there. But on the other hand, that's where really uh, the majority of the value is that space brings to this field, I feel. Okay. I mean, I, I, I guess that's largely um, for a discussion within the, uh, within the group. Um, yeah. Uh, any any response, Brian C. Amanda, Jeff Smith. I can also jump in on this. So yeah, I think yeah. it was oh, yeah. actually about the working group. Uh, I mean, I I think you're right, and I think the the companies that have signed up um will 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 talk about these topics. Um. It, it will be, you know, sort of up up to the members of the group to define our activities. Um, so, yeah, I think you're right. We definitely need to, to take into account everything that's possible. Um, and we will see how, how it evolves. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the answer I can give for now, sort of. Well, I definitely will get in touch. I'm, I'm moderating, a, what is it called? A session on how space can support the blue economy at uh, the World Ocean Council Sustainable Ocean Summit in, in Barcelona. And, and that program is still being uh, uh, developed. Um, but it'd be great to somehow have this in there as well. So I'll be in touch. Stay in touch. Stay in touch. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Um, Jeff, you make a comment about um, Grassland Watch. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to make people aware of it. I mean, this is a service that we're developing for DG Environment. It's in some ways kind of preempts some of this nature restoration law uh, kind of drive. Um, I mean, it originally came from the Habitats Directive where the Natura 2000 sites weren't being reported properly and or consistently. Uh, and so there was quite a lot of sites that didn't have uh, records or, or reliable records of their condition, etc. So EU Grassland Watch is obviously focusing on grassland. And so we're looking at about 16,500 Natura 2000 sites. Um, and so in and as well, we're kind of... Um, not well. We're delivering land cover maps, but we're also some grassland characteristics. So it then allows the local users on the ground to do interpretations themselves of uh, of what's going on there. And we hopefully will be able to then fold back in local information into this service. So I think it's really exciting to look towards the the development of those plans and of uh, the nature restoration law, and then see how uh, how we can support those. So. Um, will hopefully be operational again. We were operational in a prototype form uh, on, for about a year ago, but now with the upgrades, maybe this time next year. Hopefully, I don't quote me on that one. But, but I think it's a uh, it, because the system uses a lot of Earth observation data and uh, kind of almost hides it from the users. It all happens in the back office, so you don't need to be an EO expert. You're just being supplied with information. So that's why I've put there, it's, I feel it's an exemplar of maybe things that could be developed for other habitats or other situations. So if anyone wants to take a look, there's the link and uh, please join our mailing list or provide us any feedback. So, sorry, advert over. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's important to be, uh, to make a w awareness of, uh, of what, what, what is there and uh, you know, the group should be, uh, should be very very mindful of of that um it's not always it's not always known and it comes back again to this um i i think there's often a um something missing between the national level and the local and regional levels in terms of uh, how to adopt and use the technology and we uh, we talked a little bit about this in um um in in the, in the summer okay um um, and I take that as a as a comment in that you've you've put into the uh, chat. But if you want to come back with anything more, let me know. Um, that, that was a comment. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to ask you, so I, I've seen some comments about this, but um, this is a piece of legislation. Um, are there any funds associated with uh, legislation that will help um, develop these plans and more importantly, even to implement them? Yes, uh, the funding question, mm. the most important one. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, when, when it comes to first, just let's let's uh, put it out there. Uh, when it comes to financing by diversity, uh, there is a real challenge, um, at least when, when we talk, I mean, not at least actually, when we talk about public financing, but also when we talk about private financing. Yeah. Um, so the challenge definitely is there. Uh, there, I mean, already with what existing, what, what was existing as obligations previously to this law, uh, there was not enough funding for biodiversity projects and so on, for biodiversity monitoring or, um, yeah, even um, development of knowledge and so on. So the, the challenge will, um, you know, be the same. Mm. Currently, when it comes to what is being done or, or what is being thought of, um, right now, uh, let's say at EU level, because I will just mention uh, EU funds, uh, then the national funds are a different system. But when it comes to EU funds, um, I mean, the, the previous system or the system we're still in, uh, you know, you might be, fam you might be familiar with um, funding, uh, um, funding programs such as LIFE program. But uh, it, there was also Horizon, which could be used uh, in some instances, uh, I think, when it comes to development of knowledge and research uh, when it comes to biodiversity, so which could be linked to, you know, projects uh, of biodiversity protection or restoration. Um, however, uh, that those funding programs run until 2027. And currently at EU level, uh, the new budget is being developed. And we don't really know how it will look like. Mm -hmm. um, when we, when I mean, when we were participating in the negotiations of this new law, so the restoration law, um, I mean, from the NGO side, we very much pushed uh, to have dedicated funding uh, for uh, restoration of biodiversity because we do know that this is what is often lacking and uh, what makes implementation very difficult. So we do advocate for the creation of a separate fund uh, at EU level, uh, which will be a nature restoration fund to make sure that there is dedicated funding and that it actually doesn't get transferred to something else, uh, which is not biodiversity um, protection or restoration. But we don't know yet what, what it will be. There is a mention in the law that uh, yeah, the commission has to uh, look into the funding question and to make funding available. But uh, the extent of that funding is not yet defined. Um, and yeah, I mean, the commission, uh, I think it's together with, uh, with the EEA, they did um, issue a report uh, which quantifies the funding gap. Um, so they, you know, they, they, know, uh, they know the figures of that and they are aware of that. However, um, yeah, at, at EU level, it's not yet clear what the institutions will decide, uh, you know, also because the budget uh, of the EU is shrinking um, uh, from year to year. So uh, it is quite uncertain, but we do push, I mean, as NGO wanting to have this implemented because it is very needed. We do push to have uh, funding available because it's extremely important. And we also know uh, that at regional level, this is needed, so. Are you aware of any specific um, framework um, instruments that would, that are a sort of um, aligned or being aligned with this? So are, are there any particular areas that companies should be thinking of where there are uh, research activities that can be directly aligned with this uh, nature restoration law, with the emphasis being on the restoration? Mm. Okay, I'll let you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would need to think about it. Um... Uh, we 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 reached the uh, the end of our time in in any case. So let me just invite you, either of you, if you have any last messages you want to uh, to deliver, and then we'll um, we'll we'll close the sort of what we always talk about as being the 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 formal informal part of the EO Cafe and have an informal informal part where anybody can can join in. Please, uh, the, the, the floor's with both of you. Any last messages? If not, 
Yes, I mean, on, on our side, definitely. I mean, you know, as NGOs, what we want is that, uh, you know, this new nature restoration law is, you know, delivers uh, in as most ambitious way as possible. And and for that, I mean, that's also why it was very interesting to me to to attend and be part of this EU cafe today, because, um, I mean, definitely there is a challenge when it comes to data and, and you know, the implementation of it will be, uh, dependent on on whether we manage to you know give enough means uh, so that's a you know a call for um yeah like uh, the the national and EU authorities to make available funding uh, to give the means but also to give access actually to the to the development process of all of this um, I mean it will be key that uh, governments uh, reach out to the actors to stakeholders to yeah to the citizen also because there is also knowledge there but um, I mean we really call for this process of uh, developing the plans to be as open as possible to all the actors who have the knowledge um, to, to make it really, you know, science based, to make sure that we do aim uh, to, to have restoration. And I mean, all that we, we, we aim for is actually to have healthy ecosystems, but also because uh, our health and our economies are very dependent on that. On that. So in that sense, yeah, it, I mean, or or main message for the long term implementation is definitely the importance of having good monitoring of what is going to happen. So I'm I'm still sure we'll stay stay in touch. Amanda, any last words? Well, uh, Florence said it all, but uh, uh, from my side, I believe that uh, there's also a knowledge gap uh, between parts. And uh, mm -hmm. well, from WWF, this is uh, one of the first window that we open to Earth observation and. Uh, we have a lot to learn and we are really uh, enthusiastic about the possibilities of working together. So, uh, yeah, I believe that uh, stay in touch and uh, being creative, uh, express needs uh, and from both sides it will be really useful to develop uh, um, new tools that can uh, really change the approach to conservation. So I, I think Michelle has already... Uh... You know, talked about staying in touch, but Michelle, is there anything, any last thing you want to uh, uh, to add? I don't think so. I think uh, everyone covered it. But uh, thank you to both of our speakers and to you, Jeff, uh, for for covering this important topic. Uh, as I said, it will give us a lot uh, food for thought to start up the the new activities on this. Great. So thank you. thanks everyone. Thank you both for uh, Florencia and Amanda for for joining us today. No, thank you for the for the kind invitation. Uh, look forward to uh, to continued discussions. So um, that's that's about it. Um, the next EO Cafe is the tenth of October. We're going to be talking about cyber security. So um, please make a note of that and join us if you if you wish. <laughs>